Hello everyone. Hope you're all doing great. Hi Charlene. Uh, I see uh, Quest Board Terrain in the chat, Mia Geed, Earthman Brick, and Dungeon Mason. And Chris. Hi everyone. So Mr. Peterson, uh, our keeper is currently camping, but she also tuned in to uh, catch you talking on the stream. Pardon? I said uh, our keeper is uh, our keeper is uh, on camping right now, but uh, she also tuned in to uh, catch you on the stream. Okay. All right. So I've got the chat up here. So if people ask questions in it and you want me to answer them, I can do that. No, that's perfect. Okay. But uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's an honor to meet you. And uh, now, normally I would ask people to uh, introduce themselves or uh, talk about how they got into gaming. But I uh, have this question for you, which is like, I know you're a zoologist by training, right? That's uh, what, you, uh, what you were trained for. So how does a zoologist get to work on some of the best games of the 80s and 90s? Well... Um, to be fair, I uh, wasn't. I was. I studied in college to become a zoologist, but I never actually practiced as one. When I got when I was still in graduate school, working for my PhD, I took on a uh, part-time job to support my family working for Chaosium. I actually was their typesetter for a while, Ooh. but I also did. So I'd all. I'd already published. I'd, I'd published Call of Cthulhu by that time already, and my. Uh, my voc my vocation of being a zoologist gradually dwindled and my avocation of being a game designer and creator gradually got bigger until finally I dropped out of graduate school and uh, went full time into design. I can't say that is good for everyone, but it seemed to have worked for me. Uh, the way I got into the best games of the 80s and 90s was because I had had such a solid record at Chaosium as a tabletop designer. Uh, working on Call of Cthulhu, Elf Quest, Rune Quest, Arkham Horror, things like that. Um, and of course, game designers at that time in the video game industry were also uh, mostly former tabletop designers. That's not the case now necessarily. So they were trying to recruit other tabletop designers. So I got recruited. And then I was, uh, <clears throat> you know, Fortunate enough to work with companies that had uh, uh, a fairly sizable influence on the market. I started out with Micropro Software, went on to uh, uh, when Microsoft, kind of, not Microsoft, Microprose, uh, <laughs> that kind of imploded <coughs> under the weight of its hubris. Excuse me, <coughs> a little oh, allergy this... here, I guess. Uh, went on to id Software, where of course I got them right when they were doing uh, uh, Doom and Quake, so that was a good time. And from there, I went to uh, Ensemble Studios, worked on Age of Empires, Halo Wars, and after that, I kind of retreated out of the greater world of uh, tabletop of uh, computer games and came back to finally full circle to doing tabletop board games and role playing games again. Okay, uh, what was your uh, uh, was there was there some. Uh... So, sorry, basically, uh, what made you go back from uh, computer games into uh, tabletop games design? Well, I was, I've was i been playing games since I was a kid. Like, eight years old, I was trying to play games. I remember, in fact, when I was just about eight, my dad bought a, t a board game called Gettysburg from Avalon, uh, by Avalon Hill, and it was the full battle of Gettysburg. And really early on, the rules were lost. And so all I had was this box of these interesting gray and blue um, uh, units with names on them and symbols. And then there was this board they could move on. And uh, for years, I'd ponder what this, how this worked. And uh, then I, I'd play other games I did have the rules too. Like I would stay in from uh, recess sometimes as a child to play, to play a clue or something with someone else. <laughs> But then at age 12, I found a copy of Gettysburg with the rules in a store. And I promised my dad I would uh, uh, wash dishes for uh, a month or something to pay for it. And so I did. And uh, so the, and then I found it, then in the back of the game, there was a catalog for other games. I started playing more of these. They called them war games because they were mostly about historical battles. And uh, when I went, to, so I was interested in all these because they were complicated. And they were interesting puzzles and there was lots of 
uh, decisions to make. I got more and more hooked on these. <laughs> and then in my first year of college, through playing the war games, me interested in all that realm of gaming, I found out about um, uh, the very first edition of Dungeons and Dragons when it came out. We uh, we got a copy of that and we played it. And then other role playing games, of course, came out. We played those in college. But I was in role playing right from the start. Um, and I was playing these tabletop board games before then. And pretty much the complicated games at the time were mostly either war games of historical subjects or role playing games. And by the 80s, board games came out on other topics, you know, like uh, Titan, you know, for example. And now, of course, there's just games on every topic under the sun. It's uh, kind of the golden age of gaming now. But uh, but I kind of worked in, as a result of my age and interest in games, I guess, I managed to be in kind of on the ground floor of all the uh, uh, all the different early forms of gaming. Like I said, playing the first edition of D&D, playing war gaming back in, in 1968. So uh, pretty I much, I was there. Pretty much, yeah. Was, I mean, even uh, some of the uh, games you uh, worked on were uh, pretty genre-defining. I think I think you had mentioned at one point uh, Command HQ, if I'm not mistaken, which was one of the... Uh... Yes, yes, Command <laughs> HQ. I worked on that with, with uh, Danny, uh, Daniel Berry, then Dan Bunton. And uh, and that was really the first um, RTS game. Um, yeah, and definitely... The first real RTS game that ever was on, so that was interesting. And we thought um, we thought we did a good job on it, and... Uh, and and it didn't sell super well. It sold like 40,000 copies. That's not very good for a computer game, you know? And, um, and then when I worked to work, work on Doom, my experience with Command HQ led me to believe that people wouldn't want to play a game online head-to-head. -head. And the other people at id agreed with me. That John Carmack also, oh, yeah, no one's going to play it head-to-head. -head. But we liked playing it head-to-head. At, at our at our office so we left that functionality in doom because we enjoyed doing it and then of course it it became the first head-to-head -head game that was that was a giant hit and then now every game has to have you know a head-to-head -head version but so uh yeah i, I think you may accidentally have invented uh, esports along the way <laughs> but i have to say we weren't pushing for it to, to create online gaming face to uh, you know head-to-head -head gaming we we thought we just wanted to have it there because we liked it and then it turned out to be, you know, the dominant, <laughs> very important form of gaming. <laughs> so that was cool. We were, and when we did that, when we did Quake, that's when the Quake clan started to appear. That was not it doing that. It was people on their own forming groups to play Quake, and that's when the, you know right. online gaming networks appear. And of course, they're still they're still having uh, uh, conventions where people get together just to play one of these head-to-head -head games, so it all came out of the people. That's pretty amazing. But uh, could you tell us a bit about, uh, sorry, uh, I skipped a question here. So uh, on your Wikipedia page, it says that you uh, fell in love with dinosaurs at age three, and then you uh, studied paleontology for some time. Is that correct? I'm sorry, what was that? I said, uh, on your Wikipedia page, it says that uh, you fell in, in love with dinosaurs at age three, and, uh, I did. I did. When I was three years old, I'd walk around explaining dinosaurs to my grandpa. And <laughs> uh, I did like dinosaurs quite a bit. Um, I think my, so, uh, so in those days, one of the main toys you could get were big bags of plastic, brightly colored dinosaurs. Okay. So in my back of my head, I still think of dinosaurs as being um, all one solid primary color. A like dinosaur is yellow <laughs> or green. You know, that's how they came. And my and the one the one that was hardest to get, and it wasn't usually in the bags, was the Tyrannosaurus. If you did get a Tyrannosaurus, there's only one. And so that was that was the uh, uh, the coolest dinosaur because it was so hard to get a copy of a Tyrannosaur. And also was... because they started out with an, there was an early Tyrannosaur from the model they had in the in all the different companies that made these dinosaurs like stole each other's models you know so they all have the same models and they were really really inaccurate and terrible um but the uh, but the tyrannosaurs were made to be big and and because the tyrannosaur was one of the last models that was built it was kind of more anatomically correct Ooh. it looked more like like a real dinosaur than the others so um 
So that was that was the one that I liked, but it was kind of based on what these models were. And of course, the other toy that you would get was bags of army guys, you know, soldiers. Okay. Uh, and and they would be usually be green and gray, and you and uh, it, it, and and you 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 feel like well, I guess the greens are the Americans and the gray are the Nazis or whatever you didn't know. And so, but since you had bags of army men and you had bags of dinosaurs, then they had to fight. Obviously, <laughs> so everyone did that. You know, so it was, so that was how that was, but yeah. Um, so I like Tyrannosaurs, and eventually I finally did a game called Army Men versus Dinosaurs. Well, I called Dinosaur 1944, and um, and that is still in uh, uh, waiting in limbo. But the intent is to get that out to people because it's it's fun. You know, it's kind of based on um, our game Orcs Must Die, where you have human stopping. Well. Orcs Must Die was was a video game, but we did the tabletop version of it, where you're stopping orcs from going through. So it's part um, laying uh, 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 basically ambushes or traps, any you know, okay. like tower defense, part that. combat. And uh, so Orcs Must Die was fun. Uh, orcs Must Die did evolve into our very successful game, Planet Apocalypse, which is more a more sophisticated game. You know, it's it's uh, it's one of the very hardest. Uh, cooperative games ever but dinosaur 44 isn't necessarily cooperative you can play it cooperative or you can play it with some people as the dinosaurs and some people as the army guys nice <laughs> so this still that's still you wanted to get but there it is okay. still waiting in the wings then it's uh on the to-do list pardon i said is this still on the to did they understand you correctly that this is still on the to-do list and uh it's not out. Uh, it's not out yet, or it's not uh, released. Not yet? out yet. It's still in limbo. It's waiting to come out. It will be, <laughs> it will be here someday. Okay, because that does sound like out of fun. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Planet Apocalypse is out. You can play that, but uh, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, could you tell us a bit about your life before Chaosium? I think I guess you did a bit already, but uh, well, I mean, uh, I was. A, a nerdy uh, kid growing up in a, in a, in kind of a, not a very I mean it was a town of maybe 30 40 thousand people I had a few weird friends I was I, I I kind of had a realize what I was like when I uh, recently I went to my 50th high school reunion with my wife who was in my same class in high school <laughs> we did not date and we were not friends in high school that was afterwards so we went there, and Wendy, my wife, she wasn't like one of the popular um, kids that everyone loved. Well, sorry, everyone did love her, and everyone remembered Wendy. So, oh yeah, Wendy, and everyone loved Wendy, and she was really good. And almost no one remembered me because I was the weird, creepy guy that lurked in the dark shadows and played war games, and no one really understood. So watched monster movies. So they kind of said, "Oh, Sandy, oh yeah, I remember you. Didn't we have a class?" But Wendy is like, she was the social butterfly. Everyone was like. <laughs> going around her so that was that was the how it was for me in school i was always the weird guy that played weird games and watched weird movies and had a few close friends and not a lot of of uh acquaintances and um but i was i was a gamer like clear back like i said when i was a kid so i always liked uh playing games i always liked reading always liked movies especially uh you know horror movies so in fact when i married my wife um, I said, "Oh, let's go see this scary movie," and she said, "Scary movies." And I and I at that time I had no idea that there was people that didn't like scary movies because it was just obvious to me that they were great, and I didn't have enough acquaintance with people outside my group, you know, to know that there were okay. people that didn't like scary movies. So that was just that amazed me. <laughs> but <laughs> now I understand that people do not always like it, and that's okay. But uh, and what do you mean by twenty to figure that out? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat that? It took me into my 20s to realize that there was people that didn't like scary movies. <laughs> but fortunately, my games, although they're horror subjects, usually those, like, even people that don't like scary movies like the games, so... Right. I guess you're never really scared in a game. <laughs> um, it's a fair point. And were you already uh, designing games on, uh, on your own before then, or was that something that started when you uh, got into Chaosium? Uh, I was designing games from like the age of 12 or 13 on up. We tried to make, we had Gettysburg. We tried to make games of, of World War One and uh, World War Two and other things. We got, we got Airfix plastic figures and made tabletop like miniatures games out of them with rules. So yeah, we were designing games 
me and my buddies were designing games straight through up until uh, 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 you know. And then of course, when Dungeons of the Dragons came out, in uh, <coughs> then its rules were so terrible that <coughs> like like the that you, we had to figure out our own rules to play it. The uh, the combat system it said you could use the combat system from Chainmail, so we bought Chainmail, and its combat system has zero in common with with the D twenty system in D anD. And we couldn't figure out how different weapons would work, and 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 uh, we had to work out our own magic system. And everyone I knew that played Dungeons and Dragons had to figure out their own magic system because the magic system was so poorly uh, described that you that you just had no idea how it was supposed to work. My group happened to have worked out the system we used was actually quite similar to what Gygax thought it was supposed to be. Okay. That was purely by happenstance, you understand. You know, almost everyone else did it, did it different ways. Like if other people would, they if you had if you got like one spell and it was sleep, you could cast sleep as often as you wanted, or you had spell points, or who knows what. But I think one of the reasons that D and D spread rapidly is because only a few hardcore gamers were playing it. Well, not a few, but but the hardcore gamers couldn't figure out the rules, so they were making their own rules. So there was <laughs> this big boom in um, in role playing games. Starting with D and D, so it, it kind of worked out. Right. So, uh, were the rules that vaguely defined that uh, you know we had just had to make them up as you go along? Uh, the, the, other, the other games? Um, no, sorry. I said were, were the rules for D and D so vaguely defined that you had to make up? You know, uh, our our professor at college had a copy of it, and he loaned. He knew we were interested in games, and he loaned it to a friend of mine. And then we started playing it. We played his copy for a month or so, and we ordered. A new copy from uh, from the you know the, the the back page where it had a list. So we ordered mm-hmm. it was ten dollars. It was a lot of money for college kids, and um, and we ordered it. And of course, in those days, it took like six weeks to be delivered because um, it was all by slow mail. You know, there was no online ordering. <clears throat> and we finally got it. Then we didn't have dice for it because there was no multicolored like. So we we contacted. We used a. Uh, uh, cardboard chits with numbers on them we put them in a cup or in our pocket we draw them randomly to get numbers to get d8s and d12s and d20s and um eventually we found that there was a company a mathematical company that did uh different shapes of dice um for mathematics or something and so we we ordered those and those took another six weeks to arrive and they were absolutely the worst dice i've ever used in my life they were soft crappy plastic and the d4s were so sharp you know and they kind of dented in in the middle where the where the where the number was and then there was a really sharp point so you stepped on those things you really you really felt it uh and so the fact that we have good dice now and they're easy to get is uh something that people usually don't think about but that was something that was hard to have i remember try uh, roll a d20 to hit and i reached into my pocket and threw the 20 numbers that were there and pick one randomly and said oh it's 17 that was what we had i mean if that if that's what you uh had that's what you uh you know need to make it work somehow yeah i mean in retrospect i'm amazed that uh that gygax and arneson used multicolored dice for D D, knowing how hard they were to get but maybe it was easier in wisconsin because uh uh than it was in the rest of the country i was off over in utah so Possibly, or maybe, you know, uh, they were uh, collectors and were gamers for uh, quite a long time, I think, before they even started on that. So, you know, they might have had their own hoard of dice and didn't even think about it. They might have, yeah. They'd been playing tabletop war, war games. Um, and, of course, while I knew about tabletop war, those days, war games, there was two categories. There was the the cardboard ones, and then there was the one where metal figures. We didn't have metal figures, um, but we had Airfix figures that we used. Um, most of the tabletop metal games were with uh, Napoleonic Wars. You know, you'd be fighting uh, a Waterloo or something, and everyone would paint them. And of course, it's nothing like today with Warhammer or uh, or BattleTech. Now it's it's crazy, right? But yeah, I mean the uh, the explosion the explosion in games in general has been uh, quite incredible. But that's something I want to ask you about uh, in, in a bit. In the meantime. Yes. Uh, you are mostly now, now it's huge. Uh, in the meantime, you are mostly known for your work in relation to the uh, Cthulhu mythos. So, could you tell us yes. about how that relationship started? 
Well, I mentioned I like scary movies and that I liked reading a lot. <clears throat> and my father, uh, uh, we we lived in a house for three years while I guess they were looking for another place to, to live in the same city. They were building a house. And uh, <laughs> in so all of my dad's books, he was a reader too. He loved science fiction. And so we had this these big cardboard boxes full of books that had nowhere to go because we didn't have you know, the bookshelves at our temporary house. When he built the real house, he actually put bookshelves into the walls, which I have done in my house. So you can nice. see, you can see that I have, you know, the bookshelves in my Whoa. house. So I, gotta, I have a real library. So sadly, it's mostly not books now. It's mostly games. But the the books are upstairs. They have shelves upstairs. Yeah, I have, um, I have serious uh, shelving, you know. Yeah. Serious so, shelving. Um, so, but in his, so I would go into his stash of books and I would take books to read. And one of the books I found was from 1942. And it was a, um, it was called The Dunwich Horror and Others. And it was by H.P. Lovecraft. And I read that at eight years old. And I'd never read any, in all the scary things I read, I'd never read anything like it. I mean, I read Poe, right? And I didn't, I'm just, at eight, I didn't get everything I was reading, but I still read it. And I really liked Lovecraft, but then I couldn't find any other lovecraft uh books with him he was really hard to find um and uh and so i'd search and search and finally at age of 12 i found one other book you know i lost the that original book for three years after borrowing linda to a friend with and forgetting about it so i don't know where it went and, yeah, and then he came back and said here's your book back and then at age of 16 or 17 i think i oh yeah when i was 14 i found out at the local college library had the Arkham House editions of Lovecraft. So I checked those out. And I was the only one that checked them out because I looked, I, I see the, the the back of the book where they had the slot with check, and I was the only one that ever did it. Um, so I'd read those. And then they found out that it was, that the Arkham House editions were valuable. And so they locked them away where teenage kids couldn't, couldn't get at them, um, which is probably smart. But then in, when I was 17, I went on a, um, a trip with my dad to New York. He had to go to a medical convention during the day and then so i was kind of left my own devices in the hotel room so i walked down the street and found a bookstore and that was the year that the ballantine books had published lovecraft's works in paperback and so i, I was able to get a hold of them and then i had the first complete set of semi-complete set of lovecraft and but he was still really obscure in 19 uh, although i every, uh, as of 19 uh, 80, every single person I knew who had heard about Lovecraft had learned about him because I would told them about Lovecraft. Uh, and then in, in 80, Chaosium, uh, I, I worked with Chaosium to do a game about Lovecraft, and I thought it was going to be an obscure cult game that maybe 10,000 people would care about. And of course, it took off, uh, I think because it was so different from uh, regular role-playing games. You know, it was a very contrarian approach. If you play Dungeons and Dragons or Traveler or any other game, then you are, you go out and you kill the bad guys and you get treasure and you level up and you kill the bad guys and you get treasure and you level up. And there's that cycle that you're going through. And it's a, it's a, it's a fun cycle, right? Well, Call of Cthulhu, I couldn't do that because I was basing it on horror movies and horror stories. And you, you can't just go up and attack the mummy you know, in a fight, he'll kill you, right? That's the whole point of being the mummy is that he kills anyone that goes after him. So I had to have something to replace combat in, in Call of Cthulhu. So I came up with the investigation. You're researching the thing. And then, of course, I hit upon the sanity mechanism, which was like worked really well, very serendipitous. And so in Call of Cthulhu, instead of killing the monsters, getting mother and loving up, you're trying to avoid the monsters or find out more about them. And then when you defeat the monster your victory your your final combat is more likely to be something like pouring a bunch of concrete into the old well you know or setting fire to the house and trying to escape it while everything burned down around you and then your treasure is like a moldy old book that makes you go crazy by looking at the pictures <laughs> so you kind of and your sanity is way down so it was it's very contrarian but the thing that made it a hit i think is not because it did everything wrong but because if you want to play a game where you go in there and you fight the monsters and you level up and you fight and, and keep doing that. Literally every other game does that. But if you want something different, only Call of Cthulhu was that different. Yeah, that makes, and uh, that makes sense. as a result, people started playing Call of Cthulhu, I think. Uh, I mean, I know it was wildly popular among, among the gaming network. Like in 1986 or 19, mid 80s, 
I, I, I knew a lot of the people that worked at, at TSR, the D&D people. They were friends. We all knew each other. We met at conventions. And they told me that the only game they played for um, entertainment at TSR was Call of Cthulhu. No okay. one played D&D. Yes. <laughs> Now that, that that that's only in the mid '80s. That's one point, right? But that's what they said. Yeah, everyone loves Call of Cthulhu, and even the ones that did play D and D later on, like they still played Call of Cthulhu. So the gamers, the gaming people that design games, all played Call of Cthulhu, and uh, and 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 I have had so many people tell me that they that because of Call of Cthulhu, they looked up Lovecraft. So it had the opposite effect. I thought. I thought. Call of Cthulhu would appeal to people who had already loved Lovecraft, but what happened is that Call of Cthulhu brought people to Lovecraft. And then in um, a few years ago, I was at a convention in uh, Portland, Oregon. It was the Lovecraft Film Festival, and they said that they felt that the reason that Lovecraft was really obscure before the before the 80s, and the reason that Lovecraft is now well known was two was twofold. One from the movies of uh stuart gordon reanimator from beyond dagon and uh, which started in about 1985 and then the, and then the call of cthulhu game so the the movie geeks would see sam uh stuart gordon's movies and be interested in lovecraft and then the gaming nerds would play call of cthulhu and know about lovecraft or that and both those forces kind of went throughout the uh the the fan world and made lovecraft and cthulhu popular it's... So they gave me a, a statuette. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's it's really interesting because it's the opposite of how uh, game licenses usually work. Yeah, you know, like you get yes. a big name license and then uh, you know to sell more of the game rather than the other way around. But it's amazing because yeah, we, yeah, it, it, yeah. We 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 Call of Duty actually funded the. Re- there it is. See that kind of thing would it, never have existed before. Yeah, it permeated into literally all aspects of uh, geek culture. Yeah. So we we funded Arkham House for for like ten years, you know, really? and bought that. We funded the we funded St. Yoshi's re-edit of all of the Lovecraft books, which got us the best the best version of the Lovecraft ever, thanks to royalties from Call of Cthulhu. Oh. And I'm happy to have done it. And and, uh, and so yeah, so yeah, Lo- Call of Cthulhu made the license popular, you know. Um, I mean, it might have worked a little like Guardians of the Galaxy. So Guardians of the Galaxy was a really obscure comic that not many people read, but the movies were fabulous. So, you know, I don't know if that went back and made the comics fun, but at least... Uh, it, it made people aware of, uh, of its existence. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Dungeon Matron. I think you already touched on it, but... Uh... Oh, I don't, see, I don't see people in the chat. Uh, it's it's on the uh, it would it would sorry it would be on the uh, YouTube stream chat, but don't worry about it. Uh, so Dungeon Matron is saying, in your opinion, what makes horror RPGs different from uh, fantasy RPGs? Uh, you already mentioned the uh, you know that you can't just go and fight the uh, bad guys, but is there anything uh, else about it? The motive in Call of Cthulhu? No, sorry. Uh, in your opinion, what makes horror RPGs different from fantasy RPGs? What makes horror RPGs different? From from fantasy RPGs, yeah. Okay, the difference is that horror RPGs are generally set in the real world, though possibly in a different time period. It's supposed to be most like in a fantasy RPG. You go there's a like usually everything is fantasy. Most fantasy worlds don't have you playing in in Malta or France or England. You're in your own fantasy universe. Everything's fantasy. There's empires of non humans. You know, the, oh, that's the elf woods. Elves live there. Uh, there's a court sorcerer. Whereas in a horror game, uh, there's it's like it's our world. You, you are you are you are in in Malta or or France or or America. You're in a town. You're in Boston. You're in uh, uh, Rome. You're somewhere, and and things are mostly real. And the and the the fantasy element, the horror, is an intrusion. Or a threat to that normal world, whereas in fantasy there is the. Th- I mean, there might be a threat to the world, but it's but it's more like, it's not the same kind because the, the your norm is already fantastical. The horror is something different and other that is uh, being presented to you. I would say that's the biggest difference. 
And because it's in the real world, I mean, you can't really be afraid because the kingdom of Bayanal is going to be overthrown by the orc menace. I mean, because there is no kingdom of Bayanal and there is no orc menace. Well, you, but you are afraid when uh, Cthulhu is going to uh, explode a, uh, a, um, a Shoggoth bomb in the middle of London because London's a real place. I mean, of course, there's not a Shoggoth bomb, but <laughs> but it's a threat to somewhere that you know and understand and... Uh, and can worry about and also because in a horror game you are one of the cognoscenti you know the truth you alone are aware of the cult of cthulhu and the and the and and the, and the other people who know about it are mostly bad guys like the cult itself or their allies so you kind of feel like you have the secret knowledge almost like a conspiracy theorist that you're trying to to work with and in a fantasy world, while you might temporarily know a secret, like where the queen's diamond ring is, it's not quite the same level of uh, of knowledge. So you're telling different kinds of stories. I see. So it uh, requires both a certain aspect of the, uh, it's the same reason familiar. That the movie yeah. Alien, which is a horror movie in a science fiction universe, is not the same. Although a realistic seeming one, is not the same as Guardians of the Galaxy, which is a fantasy movie in a science fiction universe. Okay, they're, they're, I get They're you. completely different types of that you. They would be cat. You could say they're both science fiction, but they're really one's horror, one's adventure. Okay, <laughs> ah, that makes sense. I hope that answered your question, does it, Matron? Oh, and another question from uh, Mia Gigd. Uh, having executive executive produced the film The Whisper in the Darkness, what was sorry was that an experience you enjoyed, and would you do something like that again? So uh, what happened with The Whisper in Darkness is I had previously seen H the, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society's film, The Call of Cthulhu, which was fabulous. And uh, I told them I'd be interested in participating in any future jobs, things they did if they needed help. Well, they, they ran out of funds on The Whisper in Darkness, and they called me to see if I'd be willing to help them. And, uh, and they flew me down to... Uh, Hollywood, which is where they were located. And I brought a friend of mine who has actually also worked on his own movie and has a degree in film science from uh, the University of San Francisco. So what they did, they showed us the drafts for The Whisper in Darkness and what it was supposed to, and without the stuff that hadn't been paid for. Basically, they needed money for the music. They needed money for some of the special effects. Um, and so they wanted me to look at it and see what I thought. And I w looked at what they had with my uh, friend, and I concluded that I liked this movie so much that even if I never got my money back, I would be willing to put my money into it just to see it appear. And I did. And um, I learned what an executive producer does, because that's what I did. And what an executive producer does is nothing. All I did was to provide money. Everything good about the movie is from the HPL historical society all i did was recognize that it was good and give them money to finish the uh to finish the filming so uh i am i am i i'm i'm proud of the movie in that i recognize its greatness and help fund it i have still not been fully repaid that's actually not the historical society's uh, fault what happened is that they made the movie and they and they uh, gave all the dvds to a um a, a canadian company that was going to then be selling them and the Canadian company sold a bunch of them and then went bankrupt and never paid oh. the historical society a cent so they lost so like the money was gone there's it's still being sold it's still being shown once in a while it's still dvds are available it's on um i think it's on amazon uh so i get i get money periodically off of it but uh i'm still in the i'm still in the red but i don't blame them so uh there's my there's my story. I think but it was great too. And the, the real really the sad thing is that if they had if the company Raven something or the company had had not gone under and had treated HPL as well, they would have made they would have made a big proper from it, and then they could have done another movie. Of course. So that's what it cost us was that other movie. Yeah, but uh, uh, one thing I noticed is that uh, you put out of passion into your uh, HP Lovecraft project. It's, uh, I know it's yeah. something that you've well, carried totally. from childhood, but uh, you're, you're really into it. 
we're on the same page. They did the, uh, they are very interested in doing the, the passion projects too. And that's, I think that's why we hit it off so well. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so a question from uh, Chris, the abbreviated five room dungeon concept, guardian, puzzle, setback, boss fight and resolution is popular in fantasy RPG design. Can you offer a similar plan for making horror RPG quests? For RPG quests? Uh, yeah. Well, here's the thing about RPGs. About about so in in movies they teach this three act um this three act format for movies where the first act you find things out, then things get bad, then there's a resolution, and this is so set in Hollywood among the writers that they actually teach courses in the three acts and the three sub sub parts of each one. And it's a by the numbers thing where you, where you look at your watch, it's like, oh, 50 minutes in, it's about time for the hero to get captured. And it's, and one of the reasons that so many movies are so dull is because they follow this exact, not every movie has to be the same three act play. There's lots of really great movies that do not follow that at all. Okay. And I think that the escaping that the um, uh, the the oppression and the nightmare of this of this formulaic thing is what will make your games fun. And I can't just say, well, here's an alternate formula you use instead. Well, you know, read books, watch movies that are unusual. Like the like instead of watching um, a Marvel movie, watch The Naked Prey from 1967. It has a completely different style and flow but it's but it's gripping it's really fascinating you know look at some of these things one of the ways that i've done it is to watch more foreign movies uh, i watch a lot of uh, italian <laughs> japanese korean horror movies and they don't follow the same practices as american ones which makes them i think more uh, occasionally an american one like an independent one will do something unusual like in that way but but uh but also you can but Look, look, read these books you can take a book that has nothing to do with with fantasy and look at the plot line and throw it in for example um what i was working on elf quest they said do do a scenario for elf quest so i said what will be my plot and they said figure something out so i took romeo and juliet and poof i had this whole plot in romeo and juliet that didn't follow the standard the standard format for every other adventure there was like there was there's no boss fight in romeo and juliet you know but there's still a resolution and so if you're looking for something to do to make your your fantasy thing not follow the same exact plot steal something from shakespeare steal something from some novelist you like take read chekhov you know just take one of the, or or even one thing i do is i'll i'll watch like a cheap bad horror movie like I married a monster from outer space and you don't have to use the part that's bad. Usually it's bad because it has bad acting and bad special effects, but the plot is generally something that, that, it, that, that, that you can develop into a very interesting situation. So, uh, you know, and in the story, I married a monster from outer space, like people in town are literally the men are being replaced by monsters from outer space who masquerade as men because the, you know, their genetic, uh, material is really damaged back in the home planet and they need earth women to, or some, some stupid thing, right? But it doesn't matter. The whole point of a town where everyone is gradually being turned into monsters without the other people finding out about is an interesting plot. And it doesn't necessarily follow the three. You might still have a boss fight at the end, but it's more likely to be trying to figure out some way to destroy the alien spaceship before it takes off with all the women in town. <laughs> Excuse me. I think this would... how to do it. Re, uh, uh, find, think of a story or a movie you like and, and, and use that and you'll be released from the burden of the of the go on a quest, go through a dungeon, have a boss fight I think it's a good time to remind everyone that uh, for uh, good horror movie reviews they can uh, look at your channel the link is in the uh, description if they don't follow it already <laughs> there you go also, I'm not saying that the three act thing is bad the reason it's popular is because it's good. It just shouldn't be the only structure. Yeah, that makes sense. Available to you. That makes sense. So it's okay to throw it in once in a while, That's, you know. And yeah, uh, by the way, I did. I was uh, following on in one of your uh, recommendations. I've been reading uh, Carnegie the Ghost Finder. That's good what stuff. What do you think? Isn't that good stuff? <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I especially <laughs> like the, the pacing. It's uh, so different. <laughs> 
Yes. And you notice it doesn't have a boss fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a confrontation. Yeah, but mostly just like uh, one long puzzle rather than uh, an investigation rather rather than uh, action or stuff. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. I really like, he's one of the he's one of the characters that I sort of based the idea of the Call of Cthulhu investigator on. All right, makes sense, right? It does. Yeah, <laughs> it it does feel a bit more uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes than Lovecraft, but uh, you know it's uh, it's all it's all in the same ballpark. Well, it's a very Victorian thing. He was writing about 1900, 1910. I mean, he was killed in World War One. So, you know, when Lovecraft was still, you know, only, uh, I think Lovecraft was 28 when World War One ended. So he was not really, well, no, he wasn't, he wasn't even that old. He was, uh, he was kind of a kid then, you know. Okay, let's see. Oh, well, I guess he was 28, yeah. 28, all right. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Chris. Uh, what would you consider the essential ingredients for a game master to prepare for a good RPG cosmic horror adventure? Well, if you can wait a few months, I would recommend the campaign of uh, The Big C, which I have personally developed, which is going to be published in a bit, which is mm. a, uh, a modern era campaign taking place in the... in america about uh, the drug trade and the cthulhu cult in which cthulhu and the cthulhu cult are the main villains which hasn't been done for a while if you don't want to do that if you want a world spanning thing then mass governor lathotep is always great if you want a single adventure or two then there are so many of those uh, i would suggest um going to seth skorkowski's youtube channel and looking at some of his recommendations he also usually tells you how to play how to game master these uh, these adventures? So he's a really good source for those things. Yeah, I love the channel. His his uh, reviews are uh, really entertaining. Yes, we're good friends. We we meet, we and we and our we and our wives meet together as couples. We'll watch movies, eat together. And I have now uh, entered his campaign to try it out. And I've only played in one adventure so far, but. Uh, it's Traveler, which I know nothing about the rules of Traveler except what I've learned in playing. I mean, I played Traveler back in the 1970s, but it's it's, it's completely different beast now. It's been a while, even then. I, even it was unchanged. I, it, remembering the rules from then might be a bit tricky. Yeah, and he's using a published adventure, which I don't know the name of, uh, for his campaign. But I mean, he does change uh, even the published stuff. He does he does change it up a lot. So uh, even if you know the name, I don't think it would help you very much. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, you just mentioned that the uh, campaign, the, the Cthulhu campaign that uh, you just mentioned, though, you mentioned that's set in the uh, modern day. And I think. It is I... in the modern day, yes. Uh, well, what has happened is we have made a deal with um, Peterson Games, my company, made a deal with Chaosium, who are obviously my buddies, um, where we will be publishing a Call of Cthulhu adventures and campaigns. And what we've decided is that their adventures and campaigns, I mean, they're set different times. But a lot of them are in the 1920s, and they want us, and we want us to set our campaigns in the in the modern era I, I, um, to, I, I to differentiate I, them. So, like the 2020s. Yeah, I, I think I recall from one of your videos you mentioned that uh, even for your personal campaigns, you prefer to set. Yeah, it to... all of my all of my all of my games mostly happen in the modern time anyway, because I think it's easier to make. First of all, it's easier to make things scary in the modern time because it's something people can can imagine themselves being it. it's hard to imagine yourself in the 1920s it's easy to imagine yourself in the in the 2020s because like we're here and the other reason is that it lets you don't have to give the players as much information that they can forget you can just uh you can just say hey what do you want what do you want to have for lunch before you go somewhere they don't have to figure out what's around they'll say we'll just get some shawarma you know and head out or whatever you know it is that they want. So they, they, they I say we're we're going to drive over to the city. They'll know how to. They we need to go to Houston. Well, they know how to get to Houston. You know, in the twenty twenty nineteen twenties, they have to figure out: Do we take the train? Do we take a bus? What happens? But but in the modern era, everything's known. They know the gun rule, the gun laws. You know, they know that if they go to Europe, they can't carry a gun on a plane. You know, and they probably can't pick up a gun when they're there, unless maybe they're somewhere in Eastern Europe. You know, and uh, it all it all becomes much more uh, all of that 
extra burden of the campaign background is sort of done for you so you can put all your focus on the on the horror and the monsters and of course the monsters are using the same are in the same realm of the the cultists so that's an interesting thing so anyway i just i just find it easier and uh i mean there's nothing wrong with setting it in the 20s i mean that's where we originally set it but i think that there is a lot of uh uh, strength in it in modern era, and you have to remember that when I originally wrote it in 1980, the 20s were like were less than 60 years ago, and now they're a century ago. Yep, true. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, there were still people who'd lived, who'd grown up, grown up in the 20s, you know, around in 1980. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just like when, when I was playing my war games, there was people who'd fought in World War II around. Now those people are mostly gone. <laughs> I mean, my father-in-law fought in World War II, <laughs> and he passed away in 2019. Sorry. Hey, allergies. Okay. So yeah, I like I like the modern era. I think it's a good time to set uh, scary scary movies and scary stories in. I think there's a reason that most scary movies are set in the modern times, but there's plenty that aren't. You know, Alien is not set in the modern times. I mean, it's set in the future, right? <laughs> but stuff like Smile or um, It Follows are set today, and I think it works well to be set today. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, going back to that familiarity, like, uh, as a starting point for the weird stuff in Trudeau. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, all right. Oh, my coughing thing is over. Let me take a drink. Take your time. Non-alcoholic. I don't drink alcohol. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Sean Raider. Uh, what do you think of Delta Green? Of what? Delta Green. It's a. Uh, Delta Green. Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, there are terrible people who are competing with Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> people should only play Call of Cthulhu and not any other uh, Cthulhu game. <laughs> I mean, I know those guys. They're they're fine. Um, uh, I think that <clears throat> when I first heard of Delta Green, I kind of got the idea that it was an attempt to do what Chill did, which was to give make the turn horror into more like a regular <laughs> role playing game, which would be the tough guys with guns that would go blow up the monsters. But in uh, <laughs> Looking over their adventures and interviewing and, and talking with the guys that did Delta Green. I mean, I, I've been on panels with them and stuff. I realize it's not what it's like at all. And they are, uh, they in fact have the same idea for Lovecraft that I kind of do. But uh, I have never played Delta Green formally because I am the designer of Call of Cthulhu. And if I can't, if I shouldn't, it seems like I should, I should have to play my own game, right? about Cthulhu, because that is the game that of Cthulhu the way I wanted it to be, so. I get it. And, uh, Dungeon Matron, how would you compare Call of Cthulhu Monsters to the Illithids in D&D? Um, I the Call of Cthulhu, well, I mean, in some ways they're, they're, they're similar in that they're, they're just piles of stats that you can go kill. But, <laughs> but also, it's rare too, because the Call of, one of the differences between the monsters in Call of Cthulhu and the ones in D&D is that Lovecraft's fundamental idea is that these monsters don't follow <coughs> the same natural laws as everyone else. They're breaking the rules. And the monsters... <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't shed this cough this morning. I apologize. Uh, the uh, monsters no in Dungeons and Dragons are emphatically following the rules. Everything goes into its little slot. That's not bad. It's just so you understand them. But the, but the, but the monsters in Call of Cthulhu uh, <laughs> are breaking those rules. They're doing things that 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 shouldn't that shouldn't be possible. You know, Cthulhu comes from a place where literally the natural laws aren't the same as here, and so he's following different laws. You know, um, so when you say things like, "Well, Cthulhu couldn't fly because he's so big, he could never get enough uh, grip with his wings," I say. Cthulhu isn't following our natural laws. Maybe Cthulhu can change his mass, like shunt some of it off somewhere else somehow, or or whatever. We don't know all the details of how Cthulhu does things. We know that on his island, the geometry is different than the rest of the world, 
And I suspect that he can bend geometry around him. Maybe when you're trying to run away from Cthulhu, you always circle back to him like in a nightmare because he's altered all the geometry around him. You know, you just don't, that's, that's just something that, so it gives you a lot of um, uh, play as a game master in Call of Cthulhu because you can literally have the monsters do all kinds of terrifying things that the players have to figure out and react to. Which in D and D usually you don't say, "Oh, suddenly the red dragon uh, makes a portal in space and appears inside the castle." Well, that that doesn't make sense for a red dragon. It's got to follow red dragon rules. Where in Call of Cthulhu, you could find out that Cthulhu is is coming up through a through a basement duct in your apartment complex because he has uh, set up a gate there. Or you know, there's lots of <clears throat> lots of things going on like that. Plus, another difference is that in in Thumbs of the Dragons, usually the minions, the, the thing, the underlings below the monsters are not as important or even, even a thing. You don't have cults worshipping the Red Dragon. In Call of Cthulhu, you do. You have people that are worshipping those cults, trying to bring about the advent of something. And also, what's at stake is a lot bigger in a, in a horror game than a tabletop game. If you fail to save the princess in uh in D and D, then the princess gets killed and it's like okay well i guess i mean there's plenty of other princesses around but if you don't stop cthulhu from rising from the deep the whole world is cleared off and so there's this there's this urgency <clears throat> also another difference is that in D D, you're usually doing something primarily for your own purposes i mean not entirely but like if you rescue the princess, the king rewards you. You all become dukes and you get money and, and level up and stuff. In Call of Cthulhu, if you stop Cthulhu from waking up, you can't even tell anyone. You know, because if you do, not only will they not believe you and lock you up, but the people who, but if there's evil people who would have been cultists who find out about Cthulhu, they'll go out there and try to wake him up now. So you don't want them to know about Cthulhu. So so you have to you have to do your stuff kind of kind of like the old Cherokee Indians had this thing where the best way to be a good person was not to tell anyone else you'd done the good thing. You do the good thing and keep it secret. And that's kind of what you're doing in Call of Cthulhu because you can't let them know. <laughs> and so, whereas in D&D, &D, you want, you want in Dungeons and Dragons, you want to have that, that event at the end of the Star Wars movies where everyone's lining up and you're all shiny and polished and you all get medals. You know, that's what you want in D&D. &D. You don't get that in Call of Cthulhu. You get a bunch of guys who are burnt out and half insane and and crawling, battered and burned away from the ruins of the old uh, the old crypt, and that's your reward. Yeah, I'm just thinking because uh, some of uh, they're very different genres. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I'm just thinking that and uh, it's good that they're different because it means that we have multiple things we can go play. I mean, I like going and playing yeah. and saving the princess, right? I don't want I don't need Call of Cthulhu to do the same thing that that does, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, but I was just thinking about uh, the colors of the out of space and uh, what was the other one where uh, he had the uh, evil musical notes. Uh, what what were they? Uh, Eric Zan. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. One. How do you even interact with that? You know, you <laughs> have this thing, you know or or Lovecraft's favorite book. One of, one of his favorite books was called, was The House on the Borderlands, which was written by William Hope Hodgson, the guy that wrote Carnacki. And think of Carnacki's. Have you read the his story of the Hog yet? Have you got to that one? Uh, not yet. No. Okay. Uh, but uh, or the whistling room uh i was just starting on that i so far i've just said the uh the first one okay but but in but it, but in the uh in a story the house in the borderlands there's these there's these creepy pig-like things that are starting to appear around the guy's house and and they're and they're from they're looking for something in the house but what but the, it's never resolved in the whole book they're just there you know and uh, eventually he starts going to like going into other dimensions and all this stuff. You you start off and you're thinking, oh, there's these pig monsters. They have just another pig monsters. Never does the thing about the pig monsters. They're just a sign that something's wrong with the house. And right. it is creepy and effective. Yeah. Can and imagine. <laughs> and uh, so uh it's it's this crazy stuff. So you can so you can have these these stories with with these things coming in, these strange events that you can't really handle. How do you how do you fight something like that? You have to, you more or less have to learn to deal with it. That's part of Lovecraft's story. There's some things you can't fight. You can just learn to handle. Like in the story of the Call of Cthulhu, it's clear that Cthulhu, if he rises up for real, can't be stopped. Humanity's done. He's like Earth's poison pill. Um, so just finding out about it and preventing this time from rising up is all the victory you can have. And uh, 
and that's part of what makes it the cosmic horror is that humanity is helpless although of course in a role-playing game humanity can't be helpless because you have to be able to have some kind of success <laughs> so but you have to do a different level of success yeah, I'm guessing that also works by uh, setting like you never go up against uh, Cthulhu himself. You just have, have to stop the well, cultists from waking him up, kind the, of thing. The function of the stats for Cthulhu in Call of Cthulhu aren't so you can fight him; it's so that you realize how terrifying he is. And you're ah. like, oh my gosh! And if he appears, if if Cthulhu appeared and your party was there, my idea was, <laughs> like for example, at the end of the story. Uh, of of the adventure Shadows of Yoxthoth, you're on Rolia and Cthulhu rises. Okay. And there's other people there, and Cthulhu's killing those people, and you're just trying to get to the boat and get away. Okay, that's your that's your fight against the boss monster is trying to escape on the island from Cthulhu. And uh and so the fact that Cthulhu has these unstoppable stats. I mean, yeah, you can shoot him with a cannon or something, maybe part of him bursts into mist and has to reform and slows him down. But but that's that's part of the that's part of the whole. It's unstoppable. We can only slow it down. It's the worst thing, and that's that's the fun of of, of that because you're like you're facing something that you can't handle. Even the lesser monsters like Shoggoths are incredibly tough to stop in Call of Cthulhu. You know they're just they're like they have it all over you. Or deep ones. Deep ones are something that you can actually shoot with a gun and kill. But deep ones are as smart as a human. Maybe smarter because they lived a life as a human before they were a deep one. So they know everything about humans, plus they're stronger, they have other power, you know, it's like, in theory, deep ones versus humans, the deep ones should have all the advantages, because they have everything humans have, plus stuff deep ones have. And all we have is what humans have, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, I mean, their one disadvantage is they mostly live under the ocean, so maybe they don't carry gunpowder weapons all the time, but they could come on land and pick up a gunpowder weapon, you know? <laughs> Nothing stops them from having machine guns. Um, but, uh, uh, he, I mean, you fight in a deep one, that demon might have served two terms in the army. He might know all about machine guns. Oh, yeah, because they're also you know? very long lived. Yeah? Now he's yeah. 200, now he's 300 years old with all the wisdom of that. <laughs> so, uh, so if you, so the monsters are, so, the, so the whole point of Call of Cthulhu is that you are the underling, you are the, you are the underdog, you are setting up against something that is probably smarter certainly stronger and infinitely more deadly than you and you just have to do your best because this is all humanity has to offer yeah and one of the Any victory you win is 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 great what, one thing i like about uh, call of Cthulhu is also that you cannot do it indefinitely because as you uh, as you're exposed to more things your sanity starts to uh, get worn down if, that's right things if you start to learn more time. things it's even worse that's right they see, so your character has a best used by date that he kind yeah. of expires. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's part of the fun too, because the thing is, if you read like horror stories or or watch horror movies or read or read medieval literature, the characters frequently are dead or crippled or gone at the end of it. Like if you read the Mort to Arthur, everyone's dead at the end of the Mort to yeah. Arthur, the Arthur thing, because because medieval authors knew that everyone dies, and they knew King Arthur lived a thousand years ago, so of course he's dead by now. But modern books have this have this tendency to like like you don't go to the death of the character because no one ever dies. But obviously, you know, if you're watching. A, a, a movie taking place in the 20s everyone in the 20s is pretty much dead by now you know except a, a few little babies in there that are 100 years old so so you you avoid the thought of that end but in call of Cthulhu, you don't so your character is killed fortunately it's easy to make a new character or bring him in as a relative or something and that's easier in call of cthulhu than in dungeons of the dragons because in call of cthulhu your character lives in the real world he has real relationships he probably has a cousin or a co-worker or a friend, or someone else, the cop that was studying this case, there's someone you can bring in as a replacement. Whereas in Call, Dungeons of the Dragons, your replacement is a whole different guy from somewhere else. Well, my last guy was an elf ranger, but now I'm going to be a paladin from this other city, and I have nothing to do with the other characters. Um, <laughs> in Call of Cthulhu, you can more easily work it together. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a reason that you you guys are there, which I think is a... Of course, you could do that in D&D as well. They just, people just don't. Yeah, I mean, you could be from a family of halflings with uh, 36 siblings or something. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, Henrik Wilmerk is saying it follows... Well, something else about that. Mm -hmm. Call of Cthulhu, non-player characters are really important. And not like... In D&D, a non-player character is usually someone like the guy that gives you the quest. Mm -hmm. You know, or something. But in Call of Cthulhu, there's lots of peripheral characters along the way. There's the taxi driver you hire to take you to the streets of Cairo. There's the... Um, there's the guy that runs the the uh, 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 the, the shawarma place across the street where you meet to make your plans. There's there's the bellhop who carries up the package and it bursts open. He sees tentacles in it. You know, there's all these other people that show up. Sometimes they're menaced or killed, but they're there, and so they become a source, at least in my games of Call of Cthulhu, for new replacements. If you're killed, then maybe the bellhop that carried up your bags wants to know what's going on and help out. And suddenly you have a character, the bellhop. Now he has a name. Now he has a job. He has a background, and he's helping you out. Right. I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, that, that is a brilliant way of fitting it into the uh, into the game world. That's uh, I like that. Yeah. I mean, I use that all the time in my games when a character gets killed because I expect characters in Call of Cthulhu to not last through the whole game all the time. I mean, I'm not trying to kill them, but it, it happens. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there's no resurrection. I mean, there is a resurrection in the Lovecraft universe, but if you, but it's not like a good resurrection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so don't, you don't really trust the guy after he's resurrected. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, Henry Polmark is saying it follows has odd sci-fi alternate history cell phones. I, I'm not familiar you with know, uh, it follows. Like, I didn't like it follows that much, but it might be because of my religious background. Because in my faith, we're kind of opposed to sex outside of marriage so that like the only person I've ever had sex with is my wife. And that was after we were married and vice versa. So it follows, isn't very scary to me because I would, it would never come after me. So I understand that it would be scary to someone that lived in a more uh, conventional lifestyle. <laughs> right. And I liked aspects of it, but it didn't have the impact on me. I think it would have on, on most people. I really liked um, lights out though. Which is about the creature that doesn't exist when there's light and only exists when there's dark. Okay, I would have to look great, at that it was it was based it was based on a uh, YouTube short about two minutes long, which was super effective. And uh, like there's a scene in Lights Out, for example, wh where the creature's attacking a person, and the guy has a gun and he's firing, bang, 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 and whenever the gun flashes, the monster's not there because the lights make it vanish. And then when in the dark, it's there again, moving towards them further. So it's like, it's this great idea, you know, for, for a monster. So uh, I like that. Now, I thought that smile was very similar to It Follows in the kind of monster it was. Um, it's kind of hard to know how you defeat the monster in Smile, but I guess you don't have to. I think horror movies, recent horror movies that I really, really liked would include Hereditary. That was fabulous. Um a uh, really good story, and it doesn't follow the three-act play, which is, I guess, horror movies, you know, anyway. I really liked um, Mercy, which is a, based on a Stephen, a, love, a Stephen King story called Grandma, which is a good Lovecraftian tale, and it shows that the grandma who loves her grandson, but because of the Cthulhu mythos, she is evil, and, and it, she will bring harm to him. I really liked the movie The Shrine. It takes place in Poland. It was filmed, in, I think, in America, though, which has a, a really uh, um, another good twist on how evil causes. There's there's like some good shifts in that movie. I thought that was very effective. There was We Are Still Here, um, which was a uh, one of the best haunted house movies I've seen of late. Say I mentioned Hereditary. Oh yeah, and Atorados from Argentina, terrified. That was really good. Not to be mistaken for the movies Terrifier, which are about a killer clown. But terrified is literally Call of Cthulhu investigators in Argentina being destroyed by horrors beyond imagination. It's very much cosmic horror. It Thanks. starts off really strong and never lets up. There, uh, Atorados, although it might be called Terrified, is available on um, Amazon Prime. Okay. I think a lot of these are. <clears throat> I, I did have to catch up on some of these. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, It Follows was okay. I thought I like Smile more, but I said my cultural background is such that It Follows was not as scary for me. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, question for Quest Bortering. Sorry, from Quest Bortering. 
I watched Call of Cthulhu games on YouTube for a couple of years and just checked it as a keeper for the first time. Love this game. Are there plans for more miniatures than Cool Mini or not? Or Infinity Engine? Is, are there plans for more videos? More miniatures. More miniatures. Well, um, are, is he talking about the miniatures that I've released for Call of Cthulhu? I am not entirely sure because uh... I am. I my company is uh, has a line of official Call of Cthulhu miniatures, which include pretty much all the monsters mentioned by Lovecraft. We have Dark Young, we have Deep Ones, we have Hounds of Dindalos, we have Cthulhu, uh, um, Shob Niggurath, uh, Biakis, everything. We have dozens of monsters in that line. The one thing that we don't have a lot of are investigators. Um, because the, our game is mostly for cultists and monsters. Um, so if you want investigators, you have to go to other sources. But I think there's plenty of investigator characters out there right I now. That figure so, yeah. From a lot of companies. Find modern era guys. You can find them, right? You can find punks. And you can find uh, 20s characters. So I think humans are okay to find. But it, but if you want monsters, pretty much every single monster that Lovecraft described uh, is somewhere in one of my... Uh, I've got a figure for it. Okay, so uh, the... In fact, an upcoming game, which is going to be the next game we try to release, which is Hyperspace. Uh, it's a science fiction, it's a space game, right? But it does have some Lovecraft elements because Lovecraft's monsters are aliens. So like of the 25 races in hyperspace, five of them are Lovecraft, right? But but one of them is a race that's never been done before anywhere, and that is the uh, Yadith aliens. So we're going to have a figure for those. Okay, and again, link to the uh, <clears throat> Peterson, Peterson Games website is in the uh, description below. So just, just so people know, there's been delays in getting our things out in the past. We are now partnering with Catalyst Games Lab, the guys that do Battletech and Shadowrun. And so they are going to be, Peterson Games is going to mostly be a design house, publishing and marketing our games through Catalyst. So we will have a much greater market reach. In fact, anyone right now, Gen Con is going on, I believe. And if you go to the Catalyst Games Lab booth, you can buy my games. Ooh. <laughs> now, we're like I also mentioned earlier, we're doing the Call of Cthulhu products. Those will probably be done directly through us, not through Catalyst. But uh, but you'll be able to find those. The first one, like I said, is going to be Big C which is uh, about a drug cult in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, uh, it, it, which is connected to the Cthulhu cult. And, and it's, 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 it's pretty wild. It's a plot. It's, the actual manuscript is not written by me, but the entire plot and, and overarching, uh, the, all the plot is plotted out by me. So, uh, and filled in by a very skilled uh, writer. So I think it'll be fun. We have an ongoing enemy, in a, you know, a, re a recurring boss, who is a Sarspawn who shows up when, whenever he shows up, there's a storm because he kind of brings the storm with him. So this, so he'll like appear and destroy a whole town. And uh, cause he's huge. He's like a hundred feet tall. And, and then it's all deniable as to being a monster because there was that storm. <laughs> so, so, so whenever he appears, the players, the players don't actually fight him. They just like are trying to escape, but there's a, there's a fun running fight trying to get away from Oxupath, the Sarspawn. And of course, at the very end, we get to see Cthulhu himself, but, uh, because you always want to see Cthulhu, you know, you, you want to you want to deliver on the monster, right? So yeah, for sure. So uh, since you mentioned your uh, uh, religious background just now, I wanted to ask you: uh, Did the satanic panic affect you uh, in your work or something? Because so, so the satanic panic um, can be easily exaggerated. It was a pretty small group of people uh, bothered about D and D. It was called B A D D. And it was never more than a, than a few thousand people. It affected Dungeons and the Dragons a lot more than Call of Cthulhu, which is weird because Call of Cthulhu is you would think it'd be a more satanic game because we have aliens and monsters and diabolic things. But but they but the people that were in it were so ignorant. All they'd really heard of was Dungeons and the Dragons. Oh, now what what I got hammered on was actually the 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 uh, after the Columbine sh shooting. Mm -hmm. um, they blamed Doom for the shooting because the kids who did the shooting had played Doom because every single kid in the high school had played Doom, right? And so what I had was, it was interesting because the satanic panic was mostly right-wing people. Some of them were left-wing, but they were, you know, over the road. A lot of them were right-wing people that, conservative Christians that like 
didn't want magic. Well, the the Columbine shooting and do the oppressions on Doom were mostly on the left. So I had um, Tipper Gore and Joe Lieberman stand up in Congress with copies of my game Doom, waving it around, saying that this was bad and we needed to ban uh, the the gun games. And the conservatives mostly didn't care. They said, well, I don't care if they play play Doom," but the but the liberals did. So it was kind of weird. I'm sure there was conservatives that also opposed it, but it's just like the 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 uh, the, the court cases were mostly uh, on on the left. So that was what affected me was actually Doom and uh, and Quake, and it was partly. I mean, but gotta remember that Doom was was considered pretty radical at the time. Like when we did Doom, and then I went to the game developers conference. I talked to people from different companies, like Microsoft even, and they would say, "Oh, we could never do a game like this. We could never do a game. It's too violent. It's too gory." And I was like. I mean, you're shooting aliens, right? But they said, no, no, it's too violent. And of course, now everyone does them and no one cares, right? But it was considered to be this really violent, edgy game. Just because of the change of perspective kind of thing? It's. I, I think it might have been the change of perspective. Right. You know, what you're seeing is like you're doing it. And that might have been what fooled the, uh, um, the, the Democratic politicians into thinking it was training people how to shoot because they would say, look, it's like you're looking through the eyes of a killer. I said... Yeah, shooting plasma guns and chainsaws at demons in outer space, you know, it's not quite the same, you know. And it, it, we, I was kind of proud, though, when in 1993, the uh, U.S. Marine Corps asked us if they could take our game and turn it into a training thing for uh, no Marines. Yeah, we said, sure, go for it. But what? The, but we played their version. It was really hard because their version, of course, it's all humans, but your characters have about 10 hit points and they never get healed. And you have four guys, and they're under the control of a squad leader who's telling them where to go to keep them. So it's trying to be an actual military training thing. And if you get shot, you're done in that game. You know, if you're if you only get if you only get wounded by an enemy bullet, it's really fortunate. So they were, they, they you know, whereas in Doom, you can get you can get shot by monsters for a while before they kill you, but not the Marine Corps game. They were <laughs> they were saying don't get shot at all. <laughs> so that was kind of fun to see that the way they changed it. We didn't charge them anything for that. I mean, we want Marines to not be killed in combat, right? So yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Okay, so uh, let's jump onto another subject. Uh, you've been in uh, the role-playing industry for uh, most of its existence, if not at the uh, very birth where they're at the infancy. So, uh, is the growth uh, that we've seen now something that you expected, or is it uh, something like, oh, wow? I... Are you talking about game designing for computer games? or board No, no games uh, or... the game industry in uh, general. The game industry was, when I first joined it, it was extremely amateurish. Mm -hmm. It was just a bunch of fans that didn't know. These were the kind of guys that, like, a chaosium. Uh, to make business decisions, we would go into the back room and then everybody would smoke a big hooter of marijuana, except me. They'd always hand it to me politely and I would always hand it to the next guy because I didn't smoke it. But but I'm sure I got plenty of secondhand smoke. <laughs> <laughs> all smoking it. But that's how they made their business decisions, you know, which may explain why Chaosium went the way it did. But uh, but everyone was like very amateurs. We were always enthusiastically liking each other's games. There was a few exceptions that would come in, like, like the Bloom Brothers came in and said... TSR must kill all the other game companies. And of course they failed because they were incompetent. But there was a lot of inep ineptness and fun. And that has not totally changed. Um, computer games do have business guys in charge. And of course, whenever you go to a convention, you'll hear the, the developers complain about the suits. But the suits do actually keep the computer game business like running and effective. You know, so it's making a profit. The board game industry is slightly more professional just because it's been around so long. We've all kind of learned, but it's still run by people who are in their hearts gamers. You know, like I, I was talking to Lauren Coleman, the guy who's in charge of Catalyst, because we are making our deal. And Lauren Coleman, like, got to start playing and liking games. Darwin Bromley, the guy that founded Mayfair, he got to start playing and liking games. We're all gamers at heart that became businessmen. OK, we aren't guys that said, well, I'm going to open a bookstore because I think it'll make a profit. We're all guys. I really like games, so I want to do a game company. So so that's the difference in the game industry and the rest of the, of the hobby, which is that we're all gamers at heart. And that might explain why the game industry is so volatile. But if you look at who's the president of different game companies, it's mostly gamers. You know, it's often the actual designers 
but we're all a bunch of fans. And the thing about that is we aren't, we aren't enemies of each other. I mean, in one sense, we're competitors, but mostly we're, we're rivals and peers. We like each other. You know, we go to see the other, when we're at Gen Con, we go talk to the guys in the booth next to us and, and see what they're doing and they see what we're doing, you know, and, uh, and it's kind of like, you know, when you're driving down the road and there's a, there's a block of like four or five restaurants in a row, those guys aren't competing with each other. They're feeding off each other. They're all, they're all prospering because of that proximity. And that's what the game industry is doing. Right. It's like, as long as the whole game industry does well, we will all do well. Uh, we, I, we, uh, some of us like me are old enough to remember the, uh, the crash in in console gaming in the 80s that almost uh, killed the, the uh do you mean the uh atari, the atari okay. yeah. game and it was mm. because there were so many bad games you'd see kids come into the gaming game shop and they'd poke irritably at the cartridges for atari or whatever and say these are crap and they were crap and so when so nintendo tried to change all that by putting really strict controls over what their games would be so only games that would be successful for a long time. That's, you know, and then other companies started following in suit. And of course, there's still crappy games all the time, right? But um, but there's enough good ones that that the industry as a whole continues. And then board games the same way. We're all trying to uh, deliver. And because we're gamers, we want to do games that we're proud of. I want to do a game that other game company owners will will be will like that they'll say, "Oh, I like that game that Sandy did." I'm trying to we're trying to and, the, and here's the other thing and here's the really important thing about about game companies nowadays, the tabletop game companies, okay? We're not we don't think of ourselves as developers, at least most of us don't. We're not developers, we're not designers, we're fans. We're just like the people that buy our games. The only difference is that we that our job is to actually design the games, but we're designing games. At least I'm designing games I want to play because I don't view myself as like this this thing on a tier above the fans. I'm down here with the fans, playing games I like. So Call of Cthulhu is my house rules to play a horror game. That's why I don't play Delta Green. I want to play my house rules. You know, uh, Cthulhu Wars is is my rules for a Cthulhu apocalypse. You know. I, I made that game because that game didn't exist and I wanted to play it. In general, I make games that I want to play. Now, I, you remember I mentioned at the start that I really like liked war games back in the mm -hmm. day? I still like war games. I've never designed a war game. And the reason is because there's not a game about a war that I... that Like World War II is one of my favorite things to play games on. But there's so many games in World War II, I don't feel a need to do another one. I can just play that the ones I already have. Yeah. So I don't feel impelled to do that. But there wasn't a game of army guys versus dinosaurs, so I had to do that. So I'm doing games where I feel a lack. So so when, when you meet me at a convention and you're like excited about some game, I will probably be excited about it right now along with you. You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, so we're uh... all just fans. It, it makes a very big difference from uh, design by marketing. You know, it's like, yes, yes yeah, exactly. we need a bit of this and a bit of yeah. that because that's what mm -hmm. we, people will buy. No, that, this is what I want to play. <laughs> that's what I want to play. I will, I will say that one, that's what I learned at, at id Software doing Doom. Mm -hmm. We learned, we were doing the game Doom and we said, well, think people will play this? We said, some people will probably play it, but let's just do the game that we love and there'll be enough people who are weird like us to love it too. And that was our plan. We weren't trying to make a mass market game that everyone will love. We were trying to make a game that we really, really liked. I think that's always better. Make a game that some people are really passionate about is better than making a big mass market thing that everyone only kind of likes. Yeah, you that know? makes a lot of sense. I think it's so, the whole thing about trying to please everyone and ending up uh, pleasing nobody. Okay. Okay, uh, so Henrik Wallmark is asking, did Sandy like the game Hate? Hate? Oh, by by, by uh, Cruel Mini or not? I think so. I'm not familiar with it. I have not played it. Um, so I have no idea if it's good or not. Sorry. It was... Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, I saw it on the Kickstarter. As I recall, it was only going to be available from the Kickstarter and not published afterwards. I don't know if they reneged on that later on. Um, cool mini or not always has good miniatures um, but like I said I, I can't be a judgment haven't played it 
Uh, I think my son has it. Maybe I'll ask him about it. Yeah, I, I, it's a post-apocalypse game. I know that. I, and usually the post-apocalypse game I like to play is uh, is either um, Planet Apocalypse or Cthulhu Wars, which I happen to also have designed. But, uh, you know. Hey, uh, do you have any thoughts on the way that the uh, industry might grow from where it is now? Okay, let's, let's stick to the uh, tabletop industry for now. Okay. So, uh, any thoughts on uh, how it might develop in the future? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, I'm sorry. I said, uh, do you have any thoughts on how the uh, tabletop industry might develop in the future? From where it, from where it is Game now? industry? Well, I think that we're currently in a golden age of gaming mm -hmm. where... Um, or almost anyone can design and put out a game. We don't need to have a giant publisher to approve. We can do it ourselves with crowdfunding or with an angel investor and make whatever crazy game we want. I think that there will be more and more evolving. For a long time, it was almost impossible to play a game over, on, over the internet, a board game on the internet with other people. It's becoming easier and easier. It's still not trivially easy but with the advent of things like uh, tabletopia and tabletop simulator it's become or zoom it's becoming more easy i'm still uncomfortable with using zoom to play uh role-playing tabletop games though i am in a campaign that does that it's it's like it's not as friendly to me as sitting around a table but maybe eventually it'll become that way um the advantage of course by doing it by zoom is people don't have to pack up all their stuff and travel to a house to play that we can all have all our games available. Like one of the issues with uh, some games is there's so much stuff and figures you can't take them everywhere with you, but you can with a uh, 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 with with a Zoom game. Um, I think that uh, game conventions will continue to be important as a place to go and see new games and and kind of get back into the excitement of your talking to other people to play. Yeah, I mean even um, uh, computer games, the game conventions are still a good way of doing that to go into seeing this stuff and participating in that activity. Um, I will be, right now, like I said, Gen Con is going out. Maybe some of your viewers are at Gen Con. Um, it, on the 13th, I'll be heading to Germany for a small game convention called the Kraken in East Germany, um, which I love. Uh, and uh, be playing games face-to-face. -face. Um, as far as the future, a lot of people have tried to make estimates. I think that, that the future of games is that unless government interferes with us, to shut us down, that we will keep on slowly growing and evolving. So far, there hasn't been a really new concept in games since um, the mid '90s, which is when the online head-to-head -head game started to appear. You know, before that, role-playing games were the next uh, big thing. Um, so I'm maybe there's something else big that no one's no one is doing yet, but. Uh, but I, I thought for a while it might be LARPs, live action role playing. I got very involved in that in the early 90s. Yeah, right. But it looks like that is, in fact, not uh, going to be the next big thing. There's a, of course, there's a lot of stuff you have to get ready to do that. Um, yeah, so, so it's very effort intensive. It's very effort intensive. I have designed like maybe a dozen LARPs and played them. So I know how intensive it is. Oh, it's a bird. <laughs> okay. Uh... Going back to your uh, time at uh, Chaos, uh, you mentioned you, you did typesetting, yeah? I started out as a typesetter, but I also edited the products as I typeset them. And I would typeset my own products. So it wasn't just typesetting, though that was a lot of it. Uh, and then we would typeset it on this big IBM thing and it would and a typesetting machine. And it would come out in strips of paper that we'd cut out with a razor blade and we'd paste onto the, the mats. And then we'd send them to the local printing house, Lampa, to have them uh, put, put made in 16 page um, booklets and then all stapled together to make our make our game book. But we'd like, for illustrations, we'd literally cut out the illustration and paste it on the thing and take photographs of it with an overhead projector and everything was very, that part is is why we had game publishers in the old day. Cause you couldn't do that at home, you know? Yeah, for sure. and, and now you can, you know, we have your, your whole editing thing is like, Microsoft Word, you know, yeah. or uh, or Vizio or something, or, or Photoshop, and just put it together, and it's much simpler. So, is of course, there... it's better if you have a, uh, you know, a talent in it. But that's true for everything. Oh, yeah, I guess. 
But uh, I wanted to ask you, is there something from that process that you're uh, especially happy uh, you don't ever have to do anymore? And is there anything you miss? Okay, what I really like, is, the thing with, with the typesetting is you're typesetting, you're typing in stuff. And if you want to make a correction, you have to go back and throw out the whole section of test of text and retype it. And um, I do not miss that at all. I remember at Chaosium, we had type, type, typewriters and we switched over to very primitive computers at the time, right? These these old computers. So we're so we go to these very first primitive computers that that could barely run. They had like 48k of RAM, you know. And uh, and so we're playing. It was an Atom. It was an Atom two computer. So we're playing. We we're using this, this this computer, okay. And um and it was super primitive. But from the moment we got on the on the computers, there was no turning back. Uh, about six months after, or a few months after we started using the computers, we thought we'd use the computers and the typewriters both, okay? So Greg Stafford, about a few months after we started using the computers, he had to go back to the typewriter and use it because he had to type a um, a form to adopt his uh, adoptive son. Um, and of course, the, the government was not using computers, right? They're like in the Stone Age, um, especially the California uh, you know, uh, bureaucracy. So, he, so he got the he got the, on his typewriter and he cranked it up, and this big old dead spider comes up on the on the, <laughs> on the, the circle with the webs around it, and he realized that he had not touched that computer for eight months since he got his <gasps> not touched that machine for eight months. And he said, "Yeah, we're never going back to to, to <laughs> typewriters. It's only computers from now on." So, and the computers give us so much power, you know, and now. The computers are even more powerful in that I can store things on the cloud. I can, like, for example, one thing that's very different is that my company for some time has been a virtual company in that I live in Utah and everyone else that worked in the company lived in different states and we all were able to work together. And I understand there's companies and businesses where you can't do that. You have to be together in one place. And even I sometimes feel a need to meet together for something, um, but uh, only periodically. So the fact that being able to work from home I think is a thing I would that I really value because I'm able to stay around here. I can annoy my wife, you know. Um, I, I don't have I don't have to drive waste an hour or two driving each day to my work, you know. Those are all you know. So, so the old thing I don't miss is having actual typewriters instead of computers, and the new thing I don't miss is working in an office. All right. <laughs> So uh, I'd also like to ask a bit about your uh, game design. So how do you approach a new game design project? Okay, okay so um, from the very start of my game design career in 1980, um, during from 1980 up until the year 2012, every single game I did except for one was assigned to me by someone else. Right. They said, "Sandy, do a call, do a Lovecraft game. Sandy, do an Elf Quest game. Sandy, do a Pirates game. Sandy, do it." Right? They always so so. The one exception was the game Hyperspace, which I actually pitched to them and got to do. But so always the idea of the game was being given to me by someone else. Okay, and uh, by the man, and that's not bad. The man treated me well. I'm not complaining. But it meant that I had to find something in that theme, whatever they assigned me, to make my own and to love. And I always could. So when they said, Sandy, do a Pirates game, I said, okay. So I sit down to do the Pirates game. And this, by the way, is not the Pirate, not Sid Meier's Pirates. This is a Pirates game I did for Ensemble Studios, which is kind of like Pirates Diablo, which never got published, but it was a major project for a year for me. And um, and I made up my own. I look, I researched Pirates. I, got, I, always, I was able to find something about the project to make it mine. So that's the first thing I do is to own the project and make it something I love. That's easier now because I do my own projects and I kind of assign myself my tasks mostly, but not entirely. So I have to make the project mine and own it. So I feel it's a personal project. The second thing is that the way I do games, and I'm not saying this is how other designers do it. In fact, I know some don't. The theme is my number one most important thing. I want the theme to be first. So, for example, Reiner Kinesia, who is a fabulous, fabulous designer, the theme is not his most important thing, okay? He he will come up with a game, an interesting game uh, structure, but then he, like, slaps a theme on top of it, okay? Right. So, and that's, that's fine. That's not how I do things. 
I start so when I did Cthulhu Wars, I started out trying to think what Cthulhu's cult should be like. And, and giving them stats based on that. And what Shub Nigarath's cult should be like and giving her stats based on that. And so at the very beginning, I'm trying to make it all be full of the theme. A lot of designers, um, what they will do is when they're making a, a game that's asymmetrical, mm -hmm. they will make one single faction to be like the base faction. And then kind of everything else is very to that. I don't do that. From the start, my things are are not balanced. Uh, and the only reason I can pull that off is because I sent, I spent so many years at ensemble studios balancing all the civilizations you know trying to make them as as fair as possible in age of empires so that was kind of my task and i got really good at balancing civilizations and so that's why call of cthulhu or cthulhu wars the factions are generally considered pretty well balanced i mean obviously there's people find flaws you know because no i'm not i i'm not i'm not god but but they're but even this the factions they think are a little weaker still can win you know, and uh, so that's it. There's theme. So first, make the game my own. Second, put the theme in from the very start. The beginning of the game has to have that. The, has to have you feel like you are whatever the game is. Um, and uh, and the third thing is is testing and testing and testing. I get a version of the game up and playable as early as I can, and then we just test the bejesus out of it for uh, again and again and again. And make changes after every test run, and that's what I learned. Now, other like at Ensemble Studios, that was our technique. We get a game, it's up running really early, and then we're testing it forever and making refinements. Most of the game companies don't didn't do that, and they still don't. What they'll do is they'll take a while, they'll finalize the game, and everything will finally be done, and they'll start testing it like a few weeks before the end of the project, and then they'll test it for those for that time. And uh, the idea is that their game design is good, so it won't have, won't need all that testing. But we would get our game like once I was at a convention, and then the guys that did. Um, uh, Red Alert. We're talking about uh, how you have to do lots of testing in your game. And me and my and my friend who were working on Age of Empires three at the time were like, not in the seminar. We said, yeah, that's right. You got to do lots of testing in the game. And they said, do you test more than you think you do? We said, yeah, we agree with that. And they said, you might have to test for as much as six whole months. And we burst into laughing because at that time our game had been in test for eighteen months, and we didn't think it was done. Okay, but, but their game was the game where you build it all together, and then it came together at the end, and then you test it. Now, their technique of building a game put out games faster than ours, okay, by probably six months to a year faster. But our technique meant that the game was fun always because we knew it was fun from the testing really early on and we kept testing until it was fun and then we'd start then we we balance it from there so so one of the things about ensemble studios every game we did was fun and you've played plenty of games that aren't fun but i guarantee you haven't played a game from ensemble studios that wasn't fun yeah, I mean, well maybe some of the new ones that microsoft did with that different team but the old ones back in the day yeah i mean those have fun. their own tick records <laughs> those have their own those are probably done more conventionally but uh Okay, so uh, you've got these uh, kind of principles for uh, designs, and I'm guessing that uh, they uh, developed a lot over the years, but is there any particular area which you think that uh, changed most so, from uh, when you started to uh, today? Um, the, the big thing I learned was, was testing uh, over the time. We didn't do a lot of, I mean, we tested Call of Cthulhu a little bit. You don't really balance a role-playing game the way you do a, a board game. And uh, what I learned in the from the computer game field was to test your games unmercifully. So Doom, for example, now the testing of Doom was different from uh, Age of Empires. In Doom, we're testing to make sure that the map, the map runs and works, and there's not flaws in it. There's not a problem with the map that, like for example, if there's a section of the map that everyone skips because they're going to the big win, then I have to decide if I want to make them go into that section of the map, or if I want to put a really big prize in that section. So if they skip it, they'll miss out. You know, I, I had that choice. So testing was like really huge in, uh, in in Doom. And then when I went to Ensemble, and we had and because it's a head to head game with different factions, we had to make all the factions like really really balanced. And there was so much testing going on. That was one of the main things I did. Um, I mean, I also di did um, core design for these games, but uh, but the testing was this huge huge part. And uh, that's what I, that's one that one of the main things I learned from. Uh, computer games was doing the test. Uh, one of the main things I learned from Call of Cthulhu, the very first game I did, was to have the theme 
steep throughout the entire game. All through the game, you feel like you're in that world. I want the player to feel like he's thrown out into the ocean without a lifeboat. And just like you're you're in this world now and you gotta figure it out on your own. You know, there's not there's no one there to save you or or bring you out. There's not like a, a hand of God to lift you out of the problems. And so the theme uh became really important to me. So those are some of the things that I that I did learn. That, that makes a lot of sense. And you just mentioned that uh we just want to ask you, is the process of designing a computer game very different from designing a table token? Uh, yes, because in a computer game, you have a team of, of 15 to 60 people that you're working with. And, uh, and and any changes you make, you have to actually do a whole new build of the game. And if you make a new unit, the artists haven't drawn it or animated it yet. And so you have to use an old unit with like a letter on its head or something to tell you what it is. And there's and there and everything is like it's like pushing a rope. Everything you do is like going through all these these layers and layers of getting through. If you're trying to make a radical change. Um, then you have to get it approved with the uh, the upper heads, you know, the suits on top to see if they they like it, you know. So you have to. So for example, when I wanted to do uh, the Age of Empires, the War Chiefs expansion, I wanted it to be American Indians, but the suits thought well, we should do Asians. And I said, well, there weren't Asian colonies in America, right? The, the Japanese didn't come and colonize North America, but there were Sioux Indians and Iroquois and Aztecs right here that had civilizations that you can fight. So so I had to go through this whole stage of i had to i went first i convinced the game designers that war chiefs was a good idea then i convinced my producer and then i convinced the, the head of programming and art and then we convinced the whole team and then finally with the whole team behind me we went to the to our superiors and said hey the whole team wants to do war chiefs and they kind of said well okay if you all like it then that'll be good and the, and and, the, and then then they then they had to go and convince microsoft Okay, and there was this whole big process, and we ended up, and we got to do the War Chiefs, and it was, and it was, it was a lot of fun, and everyone loved her from the start, from the first moment they were playing with my new primitive, barely tested Indian civilizations, they became the most popular civilizations right. in the game <laughs> among the testers, you know. So, so that was also important that it worked, right? Obviously. But, uh, but all those layers of pushing, you don't have to do in a board game because it's mostly just you and a couple of, you know, and a couple other guys you have to convince. So, so, and also when I'm doing a computer game, it's like a year, two years, two and a half years. That's a long time to get the game done. So I'm doing one single game for that whole time. But in board games, you know, the board game does not take so long. There's not as many people to politic with. It's more of a, I mean, I have to do some of the politicking, but it's a lot easier and more fun. I don't have to go to all the artists, all the team of 12 artists and convince them of the of the glories of making a map that's based on the bottom of the ocean. I just say, hey, let's do some ocean maps. And my artist says, that sounds great. So it's it's just basically there's there's a lot more inertia and friction in a computer game. I'm, I'm and guessing... that's one of the reasons I went back to doing tabletop board games. Oh. Now, the advantage of a computer game is that you sell tens of millions of copies instead of tens of thousands of copies. But those tens of millions of, of copies the income from those has to be split among your publisher, Microsoft, who takes a huge hunk, and then among all seventy-five people on your on your in your company, and then like not much trickles down to you. Whereas I do a tabletop board game, yeah, it's only ten thousand copies, but there's only like six of us that are getting the money from it, so you know, makes sense. And we're getting it quicker, but I'm... the game takes long to produce. But I'm guessing that uh, for uh, computer games, the time to market is uh, actually more sensitive because you don't want to release uh, this year's game in five, six years down the line where it's totally obsolete. No? Well, sometimes tabletop games that happens uh, that take a while to do. But the game, but I'm done with those games. I'm just waiting for the funds to do them. But the other cool thing about a tabletop game like Cthulhu Wars or something like that, <laughs> when I do a video game, then a year later that video game is probably in the bargain bin at the mm -hmm. store. Like it's no longer being sold, but the board games keep selling forever. Yeah. Cthulhu Wars isn't like the original Doom is pretty much an obsolete game that nobody in their right mind would play. Except they're, if they're a fan of like old school stuff, they might find a mod or something to play it. But it's not, it doesn't exist in the same way that it did then. But Cthulhu Wars is just as fun now. Yeah, makes sense. you know, or or other game, other board games from the '90s. You know, uh, Settlers of Catan is just as fun now as it was then. It it didn't it doesn't need, you know, a, a, an update to work with a new amount of RAM or a new uh, sound card. You know, it just is there. So that's kind of nice. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. board games can outlive their creators, and they have. There's board game designers who have sadly passed on, and their games are still being sold. Yeah, you just you just mentioned settlers, for example. They're done yeah. in a year or two, you know. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned uh, settlers, for example, and uh, the designer yeah. for that uh, passed away this year, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. But people are still playing his yeah. game. His legacy lives on, you know. But who's going to play Chris Crawford's game in 20 years? Maybe some real fans, but in general, there'll be there'll be new games that replace it. He will only be important. Like I get interviewed all the time on the basis of having done Doom and Quake and Age of Empires and work with Sid Meier on Civilization because they're looking into the roots of modern games. Mm -hmm. But when I'm interviewed for Call of Cthulhu or Cthulhu Wars, they aren't looking for the roots of modern games. They're looking for a game that they're playing now. Yeah, think, thinking about it, Call of Cthulhu. I mean, there have been other editions, but uh, it's still pretty close, in my opinion, still pretty close to uh, to the first edition. It didn't go to all the uh, drastic changes that D&D did, for example. No, it did not, because D&D was trying to do something different, I think, than Call of Cthulhu. And uh, it was trying to keep up with Pathfinder. I'm not sure what it, what their goal was, but D&D is like a really complicated game now. It's, it's simplified a little bit since version 3, you know? Mm -hmm. But like Pathfinder still is like this complicated version and uh, the, it's like, why why do I want to burden myself with a whole bunch of nitty picky rules in playing a role playing game? It seems like it's a lot more fun just to. It's supposed to be a game about imagination, but I guess you can always dump those rules if you're playing it yourself because that is the thing you do with a role playing game. But uh, but it, but it makes for a big barrier. Like if I wanted to play D and D now, I would have to read so much rules. That it would probably discourage me. From doing yeah, it. I, I, said, mean, I can read these rules and play something else, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you show a beginner here, you have to read all this to get started. They're like, nope. Yeah, it might be because I'm spoiled by computer games. Because although computer games are really complicated, much more complicated than any board game, most of the complexity is in the background, and you figure it out while you play. You know, you're not, you don't have to, you don't have to learn the relationship between pikemen and horses in Age of Empires. You just start playing it, and you figure it out. Oh, pikemen kill horses. Got it. You know, and you don't have to know all the rules for it. Whereas it played that when D and D, say horses have a have a minus five attack modifier against pikes or whatever, you right? And and it would be something you'd have to remember. And so as a result, you're when you, if you play D and D, I'm certain that what happens is that the, the game master and the players are constantly making mistakes. And can't, I mean, I did when I played it back in the day. We'd forget something. You yeah, know? for sure. How can you remember that there's a chart for how much damage a wear tiger makes when it transforms while it's wearing armor based on the kind of armor? There was a chart for that. Yeah, I remember. You've never, how would you remember that? How often does a wear tiger transform wearing armor in the game? Once in your entire campaign ever? And so you're never going to remember that chart. So that chart was a complete waste of time by the designer because a player, the, the game master would just figure out, oh, I take 1d8 damage or whatever. He would just figure it out. He would do his own thing anyway because he's never going to remember your chart. So that's kind of my feeling about overcomplicated rules. So in Call of Cthulhu and even the modern version, there's like three or four different ways to resolve anything. There's mm -hmm. the resistance table and there's making a skill roll and there's making a stat roll and that's it. And, and anything you're trying to do, you can put into one of those categories. And uh, the game master can figure out something. And, and one game master might say, well, this is a strength roll. Another game master will say, well, you got, after you, you're going to have to use your knowledge of mechanical lore to force open the door. And a third game master might say, well, you have to use this other thing to open the door. You're resisting it. But it doesn't matter because it's it all end up with, with similar chances of success. And the game master is in charge instead of going through a rule book looking for Yeah, it. exactly. I mean, it, it's always pick one of these three and go rather than yeah. look to the index, look to the index. Yeah, here's a tool to use. Use it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so uh, one more question. So, apart from uh, Lovecraft, Lovecraft's uh, work, do you have any particular source of inspiration that you uh, constantly turn to when you're uh, designing? Um, uh, I'm a syncretic designer. I, I get ideas from playing other games. I'll play a game and say, ooh, I like this subsystem. I want to use it in another game even if it's not a related game. Or I'll watch a movie and say, oh, I like that scene. I want to take that scene and use a variant of it in 
uh, a role playing game or an adventure or or things like or I'll or I'll look at you know I'll 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 say I was I'm looking about I'm reading some historical book and and we'll talk about the wars in in Flanders in the with the Flan Flemish levy pikemen against the knights and say I like the the, the symmetry of the of the, the 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 pikemen from the levies against the knights who were the nobles and there's the king who's supporting the levies because he wants the money from the cities against the nobles who are his own class and all that interaction becomes be, be, like inspires some idea I can use in a game you know because there's something complicated going on so I'll just I just draw from any source I have I have no I have no qualms anything I see that's interesting I will steal from and modify and make my own yeah I love that it's like uh, if it's a good idea and it fits in it yep. goes. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I know that you were a professor of games design for uh, some years, yeah? Yes, for two years. Two years, okay. And no, I, well, I, I taught before then and after then oh? as an occasional lecturer, but I was full time for two years. Okay. So I'm sure that's a massive amount of material, but is there any point that you uh, think that's super important, the kind of thing that, okay, if you learned nothing from this uh, entire course, I hope you learned this one particular thing. What would that be? The most important thing is that is that um, what people are going to care about is not what you're. Here's what I cared about for my school uh, the, the, at the school. I said no one's going to care about your grades. No one's going to care about the projects you did working here. All they're going to care about is your skills. So you, so the grades are a way to measure your skills. Don't care about the grades. Care about what you learn. And the other thing that that was very important in computer design, somewhat less so in board game, is you, ha as your designer, you have to be the good guy. Um, it, fundamentally, in computer games, you have the artists who care about making things look as beautiful as possible. And you have the programmers. Who look want to make things run as efficiently as possible, and those guys are always in opposition. That's always where the Starks get struck. They think differently. They use different part of their brains. They have different goals. You, as the designer, are between those two groups. You must be the friend of the artists and the programmers, and have them both think you're friend, and you're the one that's helping them against their enemy, <laughs> the artists or the pro right. And so you must always be the guy in the middle trying to seek reason. And that is your task as a designer. You are not, and here's the thing, as a designer, you are not the only person that does design. The, 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 the programmers are designing things as they write their programs. The artists are doing elements of game design as they do their, their art. The, the difference between you and them is not that you do design, but that you only do design. Whereas the artists are doing art and design, the programmers are in programming and design, you're only doing design. And the main thing you're doing is trying to keep the whole thing on project so that everyone is working for the same goal, that, that they're all talking to each other. And I've seen it happen where they don't talk to each other. Okay, and that's really bad. And uh, it, it, it moves forward towards the big coherent goal. Your job is not to have your unique game vision be the triumphant thing, but to take all the good ideas that you see and put them in the game and to, put you, and to have your ego not be the, the driver. You are not the lone crazy artist like Manap, like uh, Michelangelo, who's trying to have your personal vision rule. You are, um, you are, you are trying to make a game that's super fun for people to play. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, I mean, I work in software development myself, and uh, I, I have seen situations where. Even if it's uh, both programmers and that they're not talking to, to each other, you know, ego against ego and uh, everything boy breaks. It, it, ego, ego has no place in design. Yeah. Except in the sense that you, that you, um, I, I look, I have a gigantic ego. All the game designers do. Okay. But I, but I can put it aside when I'm talking to people or even make fun of it like I am here, you know, and just like, but, but ego. Everyone has their dream pet kid that they want to have in the design. And one of the best things you can learn as a designer is to kill that kid. Like, if you have an idea that you really like and it's not working, dump it and move on. Now, that's hard to do because you really like that idea and you're sure there's a way you can get to work. And what I do is I take that idea and I say, this is a great idea and I love it. And I'll, I'll save it here on my hard drive and use it in another game somewhere. 
And sometimes I never get around to using it, but I, by that mental process, I'm able to take it out of this current game and uh, and move on to things that work. But I've seen a lot of games where they couldn't do that. They had to keep their pet project in and it it, it was bad. So. I think it, it sounds out like uh, having a bit, having not a bit, quite a bit of discipline. Because, for example, in uh, in many of your videos, for example, talking about the uh, Cthulhu mythos and stuff, it shows that you uh, taught a lot about the whole process and ecosystem and uh, whatever. But you know, you don't dump everything. It's literally been my full time, my only full time job as an adult. <laughs> okay, so so. I assume that means I have a really weird life, but I have no other life to compare it to. No, but what I mean is that you don't really uh, cram all of that into uh, into to the game in an obvious way. It's not like right. you're info dumping on uh, on people all the time. So I think that takes everything a discipline. In the game, yeah, everything has to hang together. Everything has to seem like everything I put in the game is to make it more fun. And it can make it more fun because it seems spookier because you're playing a spooky game. It can make it more fun because you have an interesting decision, you know. Uh, but it, uh, one of my fellow game designers said that, in his opinion, um, a good game is about important decisions that matter. Okay. So if you have a game where, like, the first part of the game, you're always doing the same stuff, so it doesn't really matter, then you can skip that part and go up to the part where you start making decisions, you know. So, like, if you're playing chess, for example, the very first move of the game actually matters. You know, it, it, are you going to move your king's pawn or your queen's pawn or your bishop's pawn or move a knight? That that actually is is different, you know. And it, and and you don't you don't have very many options at the start of the game, but there's only a few. In Cthulhu Wars, same way. When you're starting the game, you don't have very many options, but what you do matters and affects the other players, and so that's fun from the start. And when I started Cthulhu Wars, I started with only one cultist and you started out recruiting more cultists and then getting, and I realized that you were always doing the same thing for the first six turns of the game. And so I just jumped to where you had six cultists in a gate and said, now we're going from here. Now you have decisions. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay, I think we're down to uh, the uh, rapid fire questions. So, okay. ready for those? So, uh, what's your own project that you, you're most proud of? The three projects that I am the most proud of are Call of Cthulhu, which I'm proud of because it introduced a lot of really interesting dynamics into the world. And um, like the Sanity System was the first really contrarian role-playing game. And I did it all when I was like 25 years old. So like, wow, you know, I, I look back and like, how could I pull that off? Um, the second is the Age of Empires, the War Chiefs, which I fought so hard to pull through against the suits and everyone else. And then it was fun from the start. I remember the, the very first playtest, the guys came back. I, I had the Iroquois Indians, and they came back and said, these are the most fun guys ever. We love playing them. And we had to, people had to do rock, paper, scissors for who got to be the Iroquois. In the <laughs> everyone wanted to be the Iroquois. And, uh, so, and then when I introduced the Sioux, you know, the Aztecs, they were even more fun. Never wanted to be the Aztecs. So that was just a strength strength. And the third is Cthulhu Wars. Um, Cthulhu Wars. Now, a lot of games don't flow easily. I work hard and I think hard and I have to fight it out. But very few games, like Cthulhu Wars, the one of them, kind of just flowed. Everything like I was inspired by a power beyond my own. You know, every, and it was at the time I really needed that. So everything just kind of went together. And I remember when I first, the very first primitive version of Cthulhu Wars, I put it together and I showed it to a friend of mine uh, who's still a close friend, uh, Chris Lemons. And and uh, and he, and he I'd been working on it for about 10 days. And he said, huh, how long have you been working on this? I didn't want to admit it was only 10 days. <laughs> I said, oh, a couple of months. And he said, it seems really polished. And I said, oh my gosh, I felt so flattered. <laughs> you know, so I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, so those are the three projects I think I'm I'm the most uh, the most proud of. Awesome. And I can't really pick a winner among those. Okay, three is good. <laughs> so next one is uh, your favorite game that you do, did not design yourself. Okay, for card games, <laughs> this is going to be Contract Bridge, 
designed in 1928, I believe, on a trip across the Atlantic. It's an old game. It's just a regular deck of cards with four players, but it has so much interesting subtlety to it. One of the great things about Contract Bridge is that whatever kind of hand you have can be used to win. Right. Okay. Because if you have, because if you and your partner have terrible hands, then the other team is going to have good hands. But in order to get the most advantage from those good hands, they have to bid really, really high. And so they're all, so always in bridge, they're way up high, and you have a chance of stopping them, even with your bad hands. You know, if they, if they, if they're bidding a slam where they have to get every single trick, all you got to do is get one trick, and you beat them. So you always have a chance in bridge. And you can also be good at bridge in lots of different ways. It's a genius game. Okay, second, my favorite video game is uh, Coldcept. C-U-L-D-C-E-P-T. It's really obscure. It's by a, a, a Japanese company. And it's sort of a cross between Magic the Gathering and Monopoly. And I can't explain it. It's the most complex, in-depth video game I've ever played. And I love it. It was on the PlayStation for a while. I think it was, there was a version on the Xbox. It's amazing. Okay, and the third is for tabletop games that I didn't design. That's harder because I move around these a lot and play different ones. But one that I keep coming back to over the years is World in Flames, which is a World War II game about the whole <laughs> war of World War II. But it's cool because it's very hard to find a World War II game that's actually the whole war. They'll skip China or they'll skip the whole Pacific or they'll skip the ocean war or they'll skip the bombard the aerial war. This has everything. So you can make mistakes in every field. It's also kind of a forgiving game is that if you make an error, then this sets you back and the other guy can take advantage of it, but you aren't you aren't out of the game. You can still pull on back from it. And so I like that. It's, the flaw of it is that I have to you have to set it up personally and play it, and it takes months of time to play once a week. So it's uh, I haven't played it for probably five or six years, but I look forward to again playing it someday. So those are some of the games I like that are not by me. Okay. And okay, so a game that you think has a, a great design, though not necessarily the most fun. Magic Realm. Yes. Magic Realm. Okay. 1970s, Don Greenwood. Um, he was tasked to do a game like D&D, and he had no idea what D&D was, so he did a board game. Seriously? And that game, Magic Realm, has so many interesting ideas. It's like a game designer's playground. It's full. It has a combat system that's interesting, intellectual. I've never seen a freedom before. It has tiles that flip over and change the paths and the actions, it's it's really complicated and difficult to play, but there's so much stuff in Magic Realm that uh, I find it a go-to thing to go and see, ooh, what will Magic Realm have for me now? What does Magic Realm have for me now? And uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's that that is the game I would pick as a game that that is probably not fun to play, though it's intellectually interesting, but it's full of stuff. So... Okay, I'm still surprised by the bit. Okay, he uh, wanted to do a D&D game, but did not know what D&D was. Like... He had never played D&D. He had no idea. So okay. he did this game instead. <laughs> Another example of that is at, uh, at, uh, SPI, Strategy Studio Publications. They were another war game company. Mm -hmm. And and the boss came down and said, do a uh, role-playing game. Role playing, do a science fiction one. There's not They were all fantasy. So he said, okay. So he did, let me see if I can find it. Um, well, I don't seem to have it down here, but it's called Universe. Okay. The game is called Universe, and um, and it was a science fiction role playing game. And the guy designed the whole game using the standard SPI techniques, and then. Just before the game was published, he played in a game of D and D with some friends. And was like, oh, so that's what it was like. Playing game, and he just designed a whole role play game without ever, ever after you played a role playing game. And and he and he and his eyes bugged out, and he said, "Oh my goodness, this is what role play is." He had no idea. And so, Universe is a whole role playing game designed by a guy who'd never played a role playing game. 
and it showed. And, <laughs> and, and it was, uh, it's kind of a hilarious game to look at. But, uh, <laughs> That's weird. I mean, uh, I think this. I don't think this kind of uh, things happen anymore. But it's, uh, it's like you said, you know, different business uh, practices in the eighties <laughs> and seventies. No, that was they just said make a role playing game. He said, "How hard can it be? I've done all these war games." And so he made it kind of like a war game, except with role playing stuff. And and then he when he played it, he said, "Oh, n now I know what role playing is a little bit." Because all it took was one game, and he knew his horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's what. Now, Don Greenwood had also not played D&D, but he didn't try to make a true role-playing game. He just made a game that had role-playing elements. You're fighting trolls and dragons and stuff. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a, definitely a board game. Okay, last question okay. for today. So, what, in your opinion, makes a good rule set? Um, the rules are clear to the players. Mm -hmm. My rules do not always do this. The rules are fun to read. My rules sets usually do this. And it's easy to find a, an answer or a question you have. And my rules, I think, are about in the mid-level on that. Are you talking about the rules you're reading or the rule set for the game? Uh, it depends on the game. Like, I, I'm really good at making non-symmetrical strategic games. That's kind of my, my thing. Mm -hmm. um, so like, like, what makes good fun there is for the players... Like, for example, in Call of Cthulhu, in Cthulhu Wars, and this is not from me, this is from reviewers, they say the reason they like Cthulhu Wars is because when you play Cthulhu Wars, have you played it? Uh, not yet, no. Okay. You feel like you are all-powerful. You have so many ways you break the rule that if you can only get your act together, nothing can stop you. You are, you are it. And every player breaks the rules a different way, and they all get that feeling, and the important thing is they're all right. The problem is that if other people get their act together first or at the same time, then meet the you have competition. And so, uh, but you but you have this feeling of empowerment, you know. Um, whereas if you're playing my my game Planet Apocalypse, you don't feel empowered. You feel like these demons are horrible. How can I beat them? That guy just appeared on the map and we're all set on fire. That sucks. So you always feel like you're struggling, struggling, struggling. And then when you if you win. Whenever you win Planet Apocalypse, you always it's always like you're down to your last health point, you're about ready to die, you just barely pull it off, and you and you like you feel like you had a huge triumph against overwhelming odds. And that's the fun of Planet Apocalypse. But it's a different kind of fun than uh, Cthulhu Wars. That goes back to the uh, theme of the game that you were talking about earlier, right? It's the theme, but it's also the, the thing that is fun for the players. In mm. Cthulhu Wars, the fun for you is putting together your, your ability set and and tricking the other players and and using your powers to exploit them in planet apocalypse it's using your brains against the brawn and might and sheer horror of the demons to win the game and so those are you feel like you're a cunning little mammal trying to escape the di mighty dinosaurs you know whereas in Call cthulhu wars you are the mighty dinosaurs you know <laughs> and uh and, and and so and so there's just there's just different feels you know and th then there is uh uh the upcoming game hyperspace is sort of intermediate between those where you are cunning and you have asymmetrical powers. You don't feel like you're all powerful, but you you're pretty powerful and you have techniques they can't they can't handle because your abilities are gonna be on them. So it's it's not quite as it's it's uh it's its own thing. I think it will be very popular when we get it out. I'm desperate to get it out. My real goal is I want to get it published before my dad dies and he's 95 so I don't have much time. You do like science fiction. It's my big science fiction game. That's my goal. So. Think about it. Didn't you already okay. it on a well, this game? This was a good interview. Do you have any other final questions? Uh, it's been two hours, though, so maybe you have to break it up into multiple segments. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. We'll just uh, leave it in all one to our extravaganza. But uh, just just one question I was thinking, because uh, hadn't you already worked on a game called Hyperspace or Hyperspeed? Yes. Oh, right. Okay, so I did a I published a video game called Hyperspeed in 1991. Actually, Lightspeed. Then the next year, in 92, we did Hyperspeed, which was an expansion of it. Okay, and that game is available on Steam. Okay, okay, so different thing. Just uh, the hyper, uh, hyper got me mixed up. And there. <laughs> now there's a board game that I that I designed and play tested for years and got polished. That was called Hyperspace. Okay, and there you it go. is right. not yet released. We 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 kickstarted it and we haven't released it yet. And we're going to as soon as it's our next 
goal to get that game out. And uh, and uh, so that is the uh, that's what we have going. Gotcha. So, so I have two hyper games: hyper speed <laughs> and hyper space. I think all your games are hyper. But still, uh, Mr. Okay. Peterson, thank you so much for this uh, this interview. It's been a pleasure talking to. You. You're very welcome. <laughs> and go going to go and uh, and uh, go about my days. Take care. You have a lovely day. Okay, I'll be able to get to Malta. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll make the Gen Con. Oh, maybe, but uh, I'll have to get you dinner whenever we meet. So, <laughs> take care, everyone, and goodbye.